Hi, everybody. My name is Sean Wright, and I'm a uh, certified recovery support peer specialist here in Texas. I'm based out of Abilene at the Abilene Recovery Council. I also work as the program director for the Recovery Support Services Program here. And so we've been doing this work for a little over seven years. We were one of what was considered now one of the legacy programs uh, as far as state funded recovery support services that was rolled out back in 2014. So just here with you today to spend a little time talking about uh, telementoring and how we have been able to access that as peer recovery coaches, as recovery support peer specialists to uh, just bridge the gaps as far as some of the need for services that we've seen in just nearby remote communities. And then also how telementoring through Project ECHO has not only helped us develop our programs further, but how it also kind of parallels with the telementoring that we try to provide as recovery coaches. And so starting off with just a little background into this type of work that we do with a brief definition, this is the working definition of recovery that we do our work from. And so one of the things that people often find interesting about this is that it doesn't even reference anything specific to substance use. And so for a lot of people, when we're dealing with helping people in recovery from substance use and or mental health disorders, very often traditionally, that's the focus of just how do we quit the behavior? How do we help them quit using whatever the chemical is? Whereas now what we do is really focus more on this gradual process of changing, helping people live self-directed lives and some of those other highlighted words there that you see that really kind of stand out to where what we're talking more about is helping people achieve a certain quality of life, helping them find a level of stability or wellness or wholeness or whatever they define that as for themselves to where the problematic behaviors, the addictive behaviors, whatever it might be, they just kind of go away. They uh, are no longer on the radar. They just don't jive or line up with this new way of living. And so that's where we get to see people kind of launch into this new way of living that's uh, extremely satisfying for them. And so some of the guiding principles that we do this work under as well as provided by SAMHSA, you know, we try to make sure that we're building a sense of hope for people maybe that have found themselves for whatever period of time experiencing a sense of hopelessness. All of us as certified coaches do have lived experience in long-term recovery ourselves. It's one of the qualifiers to even do this work as far as the state-funded programs. And so hopefully in sharing a little bit of our stories, we're able to initiate some hope for these folks, but then also just having those conversations as we're continuing to work with them in the coaching process, helping them celebrate successes, every little small win counts, stuff like that to just continue to build up that hope. Peer support, again, coming from a peer model where we have to have that lived experience to be able to work. And so we can hopefully empathize and have a little bit more of an understanding of where that person is. We don't have identical stories, but we can probably relate in some ways. Everything that we do is based on self-determination as well. So even though I've got my own success and my own lived experience in long-term recovery, it's never about me telling somebody what I think they should do, or this is what worked for me, so you should do the same thing, or I heard so-and-so try this, maybe that's what you ought to do. It's always based on, well, what do you think is best? You know yourself better than anyone. So you tell me what your hopes are, what your values are, what your ambitions are, what your you know ideal life is, and you tell me the best way that you think or the best path we should take to help you get there, and then let me walk alongside you. We believe that there are multiple pathways to recovery, and so what works for one doesn't necessarily work for the other, and so we're happy to help people explore just the wide array of options that are out there when it does come to different types of recovery, and it may be multiple pathways that works for one person. That was certainly my experience. I've been in long-term recovery now for over 17 years, and there was never just one pathway that worked for me. I kind of chose and picked from a lot of different pathways, and I kind of have what you would consider, I guess if you saw it from a distance, it would kind of look like a puzzle or a patchwork quilt or something, right, with just lots of bits and pieces from these different things that wound up working for me. We also work from a holistic approach, so it's looking at the whole person, again, not just focusing on substance use behaviors, but looking at all areas of life, different domains of life that we'll talk about more here in just a minute, so looking at the mind-body spiritual aspect of things. We certainly want to take into consideration people's culture and addressing trauma. We come from a very trauma-informed, very trauma-sensitive type approach always focusing on strengths and uh, people's talents, right? All those things that really help make them succeed and help them thrive in their life and always coming from a place of respect. So recovery support services, that's just where we as peer recovery coaches are trying to bridge those existing gaps that may be within the person's literal community. It may be gaps within their family system. It may be gaps within just kind of how they think and feel about themselves, all that kind of stuff. So it's our job to help them, again, navigate those with whatever pathway or pathways works best for them. In addition to addressing though, whatever the substance use and or mental health concerns may be, we certainly wanna be those resource brokers that are connecting them to other providers in the community 
community, doing those warm handoffs, helping them understand what to expect when they go to this provider, not just handing them a flyer and saying, you know, give them a call. Good luck. Hope that works out for you. But being very involved in that process as well. Again, the holistic approach, looking at those multiple domains or a thing that we refer to as recovery capital. And again, I'll show you a little bit more of what that looks like and helping people build recovery capital, find stability within their rec recovery capital here in just a few more slides. So coming from a recovery oriented approach, when we're providing our services, the agencies that are providing peer recovery support services like us come from a very person-centered paradigm. We're all about the strengths and the assets and focusing on resilience, helping people celebrate all the things that they have already survived. Again, when it comes to you know overcoming trauma, celebrating those things that they've already found do work for them and the things that they have demonstrated resilience in. And then on some of the strategies there, you'll see on the other side, inviting family members and allies to be a part of it. We know it's very important for people to develop some sort of a support network or their tribe, right, that they can trust and rely on. Uh, so if they don't have that as we start to work with them, we try to help them and build that as part of their uh, recovery coaching experience. Again, always honoring autonomy and self-determination. Uh, these are the things that make us very different in the recovery field from some of the more traditional things. And that doesn't mean that like traditional counseling or tra traditional 12-step sponsoring, that those things aren't effective. They certainly are. And those are exactly what some people need and how uh, some people really thrive. But again, we also know that some people don't thrive in those particular type of traditional models. And so we're trying to provide something that uh, is a little bit different. And so these are some of the strategies and uh, a little bit of a snapshot of what that looks like. So I mentioned recovery capital before. So these are the 10 different domains of life that we help people find their stability or wellness or wholeness in. And so again, it's not just about the substance use or whatever those addictive behaviors may be. It's looking at the psychological and physical wellness. It's looking at what does that mean to have community connection or having a sense of belonging? And that might be the community at large, uh, or it might just be within you know, a subset of that community. It's wherever that person feels like they really thrive looking at that support system, building that positive support network if it's lacking, looking for meaningful activities. Everybody's got to have some sort of a positive outlet. So a hobby, a personal interest, something that they find that really gives them peace of mind and being creative or whatever that might be. And certainly basic needs when it comes to like housing, having a place where they feel safe, where they have some privacy, all those kind of things will help them explore that. And then the risk-taking behaviors, that's the stuff that, you know, we want to make sure that people have solutions for as far as like, you know, making sure that there is adequate and sustainable income, that there are these other things in place that help prevent people from getting back into old ways of thinking or, you know, the willingness to take some risks to try to get basic needs met. We want to make sure that those are met fully and completely. And then again, just overall coping and life functioning skills. Again, with the multiple pathways, we're looking at what some people consider kind of like the one way only way as far as abstinence based recovery. But we also know that a lot of people actually thrive and have perfectly uh, good balanced healthy lives when it comes to moderation based recovery. And so maybe from a harm reduction approach and just learning how to use the things that they rely on in a little bit safer manner. It's a little bit of a different paradigm for a lot of people to embrace, but there's also a lot of success that comes from that. And harm reduction is really not that different when you think about the way that it's actually applied in some different medical practices when it comes to like diabetic medication, harm reduction, when it comes to quitting smoking, you know, using patches or vapes to kind of help progressively get to that point. But we always want to be able to be open to that conversation as far as what is this this person's actual recovery goals, like what is recovery for them? And we want to help them uh, accomplish whatever they have defined that as. It's not my job to define that for them. And then of course, medication assisted recovery. So that's methadone and um, buprenorphine, things like that, that can help specifically when it comes to the opioid use disorders. We certainly want to help people connect to the appropriate resources for that. And so again, just some of the strategies that we use in building these relationships, focusing on a very non-judgmental attitude, incorporating peers and allies, trying to make sure that we keep everything very person-centered, very like literally uh, in their own words when it comes to the way that we provide some of our services, the way that we document their journey, things like that. We certainly promote non-stigmatizing language and helping people avoid labels that are not necessarily helpful and can sometimes actually be very harmful or actually kind of stagnate people in their process of wellness. Some other service strategies here, just to give you a little bit more of a glimpse, but also some technical stuff that's not super important to spend time on today, but feel free to ask questions. And then again, just helping people navigate what Bill White, kind of the guru or one of the grandfathers of this movement that we're a part of, would refer to as the stages of recovery, helping people initiate that and kind of get into whatever those first steps are of their recovery journey, helping them stabilize, come to a kind of a new sense of normalcy, and then being able to sustain and maintain that, 
And like I mentioned earlier on, ultimately the goal is to help people achieve really this high quality of life that maybe they never thought they could achieve, but getting that quality of life to where the problematic behaviors just don't resonate with them anymore. It's not about just trying not to use. It's not about just trying not to act out again. It's my life is so healthy and so uh, gratifying now. I just don't have the need to even engage in those types type of activities. So some barriers that we see though out in the remote communities to accessing treatment and or recovery is the fact that certainly, you know, cost is an issue. It's just not financially feasible. Uh, insurance may be an issue. They just don't meet the admission criteria. There are certain things that, you know, have to be met in order to even get into state funded treatment or other treatment settings. Transportation is a very common issue. And there may just be some physical and mental things that are going on with them that just doesn't make that type of a setting feasible for them right now or make it feasible for them to even leave right their local community. There's also that potential of loss. So if I do go to treatment or if I do go somewhere else to access these services, what about my job? What about my finances? Who's going to pay my rent? Who's going to pay my bills? Who's going to take care of my kids, right? Like life doesn't stop just because people need to have access to treatment and or recovery support services. So that's a very real challenge and a real uh, barrier for a lot of folks. So the area that we are in over here in region two has a lot of small counties that we, prior to being able to do things virtually, really did have a hard time getting access to. And so you'll see some of the populations that are around us. So we're talking about some very small areas. Abilene's kind of the big city for this area. And then looking to the West, the next biggest one would be Sweetwater, but there again, a very small community compared to other parts of the state. And so telementoring when it comes to actually providing recovery support services, this is how it really plays out for us. You know, you've got the barriers on the one side there, as far as the cost and the limited resources and all those things that we really have heard over the years are the reasons why people just couldn't get access to the things that they needed. And if it didn't exist in their community, whether it was a voluntary type thing provided by a church or some other agency, you know, there's just not always a lot of sustainability for nonprofits in some of these more uh, rural outlying areas. So with the telementoring, these are the solutions that we're able to provide. We we're able to provide that access. If we can reach out to somebody virtually and they don't have to worry about transportation or gas money or you know their schedule and stuff like that, then that certainly helps us be able to provide services in a way that is a lot more realistic for them. State funded programs like ours are free to the community. Some are also linked up with Medicaid and so they can bill that way. And so again, cost is not an issue that they have to worry about. Those virtual meeting spaces allows for confidentiality and privacy. And so in those small communities where there may be the concern of, if I go out and admit about some of my behaviors or some of the things that I'm dealing with, or if I go to this meeting, well, I know that people from my church or from work or from, you know, my neighborhood are going to be there and I'm worried about stigma, uh, being stigmatized or, you know, judgment and stuff like that. And so this uh, telementoring opportunity provides them with the opportunity to have those kind of conversations in a way that's very private and very confidential and very safe. One of the things that it also provides is partnership with local agencies, knowing that some of the remote communities still struggle with having sustainable Wi-Fi connections and things like that, or just even Wi-Fi or internet services, you know, may not be accessible in some of those remote areas. So we can try to partner with agencies that do have the technology or a stable Wi-Fi. And, you know, maybe we can make arrangements for the people that we're trying to reach out to, to access those locations. So we can still provide support. And then telementoring via Project Echo. So Project Echo is one of the things that's really helped us on recovery support service programs that are receiving grant funds specific to the TexMood program, which is the Texas Medication for Opioid Use Disorder, to develop these programs similar to what we're, we've been doing with traditional RSS, but there's also some nuances there that are very specific to the Texas Mood paradigm. And so through the Project Echo experience, we get to go into a all teach, all learn type environment where there's a didactic presentation. We'll have somebody that is either a subject matter expert from one of the programs that's already part of the Texas Mood funding, or it may be, you know, somebody from an outside entity, but they'll provide some sort of a topical lecture. And then one of the peer specialists will provide a case presentation, something that they're working in real time. And just what are some of the successes? What are some of the challenges? What are some of the barriers they're experiencing. And, you know, then it's a, an open dialogue as far as some feedback or suggestions from peers that are out there in the field doing the same type of work that they are. So it's a really cool opportunity to, again, learn from each other, teach each other. And through this, what we're hoping is that as the professionals hear from the peers, 
that are out in the field doing the work that the peers are hearing from the subject matter experts that best practices will emerge and that we'll just continue to see the quality and the capacity of peer support services around the state just continue to blossom, to expand, to grow, and to uh, hopefully just always be you know, improving as far as quality. And so one of the things that I see as really cool between ECHO and peer recovery coaching is that as peer recovery coaches, we're reaching out into these remote areas, there's that opportunity for all teach, all learn there as well. So we can provide education and experience when it comes to, you know, navigating multiple pathways of recovery, living a life in the long-term recovery, things like that. But we can also learn from the peers that we're working with as far as like, what is that real world experience that they have? What are those barriers and the challenges that are unique to living in those remote communities so that we can, again, improve our programs and hopefully be even more instrumental and more impactful in those areas that we may not fully understand if we didn't grow up in that type of a context. We haven't had a lot of work experience in that context. There certainly are certain nuances, again, that exist in some of those more remote locations. And the more that we can learn from the peers that we're working with, hopefully the more that we can uh, benefit their communities in the future. So that's all I had to share with you today. And I hope it's been beneficial for you. Uh, if you weren't familiar with uh, peer recovery coaching or uh, any of the other topics that I brought up, look forward to your questions. And I just want to thank you for your time. Thank you. Mm -hmm.